Maybe we can resume in time, also for the people online that are waiting. So we keep going to the afternoon. So we have with us Catherine Lenzen. She was, uh, she is an expert of uh, media communications in specifically for scientific uh, dissemination. She was um, babysitting us <laughs> for all the IPCC <laughs> uh, time. Uh, so she is well trained <laughs> to deal with uh, not expert the communicator. Um, but she was really um, very helpful. We learned a lot from her and the team that was working with her. And so today she will just give you a little bit of uh, what we have got during the IPCC probably training. Thank you, Catherine. The floor is yours. For the online people, uh, well, Catherine will drive you and tell how to proceed. Yeah. OK, thanks, Erica. And hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it was also really a pleasure working in the IPCC with all of the, um, our working group one authors. It was not babysitting. It was eye-opening, and I learned a ton as well. And, and I got to you know, in interact with some really wonderful people. Um, so yeah, today, for the online people, if you have questions, um, feel free to, I'm not sure how I'll be able to I see the chat. OK, yeah, so Erica will keep an eye on the chat. And, um, and you can put your questions in the chat or raise your hand. Um, I think we have plenty of time to get through everything that we're How do I advance? Oh, there we go. OK, so I think we have plenty of time to get through. Thank you. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just getting going. Um, so I think we have plenty of time to get through this agenda. And this agenda, the plan is to give you some chance to work on your communications. Because what I'm going to tell you over and over is that... Is this better? Yes. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to tell you over and over is that the best way to get better at communications is to practice it. So we're going to start out today, and, and you're going to practice it, and you're going to have some time to think about, um, you know, I'll, I'll give a short presentation. Um, it says 40 minutes here, but that includes some time for questions and discussion. Then you are going to sit quietly and work on your own messaging. Um, and then afterwards, we'll come back, and you can, we can share some of those. We can share some reflections and, and talk about it. Then we get to take a break. Um, and then we're going to come back, and you're going to be both a, a media person, an interviewer, and you're going to be an interviewee. So we're going to split into groups of two, and you're going to interview each other. So you're going to practice um, the messages that you've just developed. And also, um, yeah, so we'll talk about, about that a little bit more when we get to it. So. To start on, so these are my key messages to you. Um, this is, you know, starting with science communication basics. I'm talking today about media, but this, these basics can underlie any type of communications you do. Also, even in like visual communication, which you'll talk about tomorrow, outreach. Like starting off with these four steps will help you in, in any type of communication. So one is knowing your audience. Um, two is working on your messages, which we're going to do today. Three is, is practicing, which we're also going to do today. And four is be strategic. So you are busy scientists. You don't have time for everything. You need to focus a bit on, on when and how you communicate. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So knowing your audience. Um, when you start to communicate about anything, First step is always, who, who am I talking to? Um, there is no one general public. Who is the general public? We, you come from many different countries. Even within your country, there are many different audiences. There are different age groups. People have different interests. People use different sources to get information. People have different educational backgrounds. People care about different things. People believe different things. So. Yeah, they speak different languages. Um, and so all of these things are important. You can't know everything about your audience, but you can know some things, and you can research other things. Um, 
with respect to the media, um, you can look up what outlet they're writing for, uh, where they're published, what language they're published in. You can look at previous media coverage. Um, if you're giving a talk at a university, you can check what level are the students, you know, where, what are they studying. All of these things are really important. And even if you just do a little bit of looking into your audience, you're going to be better prepared to communicate with them than if you come in completely cold or if you give, try to give the same presentation, the same messages to every single audience. OK, next step is your messages. Um, so I put here, I actually studied neuroscience. Um, so I have a background in science, and it's, it's neuroscience. So if I came to you and started talking, talking to you about the, um, um, what I studied, which is this little bit, and actually I studied the, the neurotransmitter transporters, which don't even appear in this figure. So, you know, to really understand what I studied there, you would have to understand all of this complicated system, which is, you know, just one neuron within a brain. And so do I have to tell you absolutely everything about the background of this or the theory of the brain or, like, how they first studied the, the neuron with a squid um, in order to understand, like, what, what's actually my key message here? So my key message there depended very much on my audience. If I'm talking to a funder or writing a grant, I'm probably going to talk about how um, this system is related to diseases. Um, so some of these, or how it's related to drugs. Um, so for example, the, when you take cocaine, it has an effect on your neurotransmitter transporters that is one of the processes that's thought to underlie addiction. So that's maybe like why someone might care about it um, if they're a medical you know, grant funding agency, for example. Um, if I'm talking to somebody in the general public, you know, what, what do they find interesting? If I tell them I'm a neuroscientist and I study neurotransmitter transporter trafficking, um, they're just going to tune out and not care. Um, so can I find a different way to introduce you know, what I study that might interest them? So maybe I say, I'm a biologist and I study how your brain works. Or maybe I say, I'm studying why people get addicted to drugs. Um, and that might you know, be kind of interesting and maybe they would ask me more questions. Um, or if I'm talking to a journalist, I might want to talk about my most recent finding. Um, and then I would have hopefully developed some messages around what I have found and why it matters and that kind of thing. Um, I have to, so you have to keep it simple. You have to, you know, start with why do you care? Um, and then cutting out the jargon. So all of these science terms, like, I probably don't need to tell you about the polyribosome or the microtubules or the neurotransmitter transporter traffickers. And even if I were, I definitely wouldn't use the acronyms that we use internally to talk about those. So, um, yeah, just giving you some science that hopefully you're not familiar with to get an idea of how your science might also look to people who aren't familiar with what you do. Next step is to practice um, and to listen. So really the best way to communicate is to, or to, to learn how to be a better communicator is, is to do it with different audiences um, and to you know, then be self-critical, like invite feedback um, also, and then reflect and kind of change things up. Um, so I put here a photo of the Working Group 1 co-chair Valerie masson delmotte because she does this really well. She, she takes her messages like home to her kids and tries them out on them. Um, she, you know, this is at COP. She was invited youth to come and sit with her and, and talk and ask questions. Um, she asked people for feedback on Twitter. Um, so she really kind of experiments with it and is, is you know, um, it's, it's very difficult because it's hard to, like, get this critical feedback from people who maybe aren't experts. And, and um, yeah, like, it's always difficult to, to see yourself on camera, for example, or to, to hear yourself speak. But the more you do this and the more you can kind of, like, step back and, and assess it, and sort of more like, you know, as a scientist, like take a step back and, 
and not see it personally, but see like, okay, did this work? Like how effective was it? Um, and you can do that really informally by just asking people like, you know, like asking people if they understand, but also like looking at your audience when you're talking to them. Like, are they all looking at their phones if you're in like a public setting? Or are they looking at you? Are they nodding? Um, if you're in like a one-on-one -on -one conversation, there's this like glazed look that people get, you know, that where, where they like nod, but they're just checked out of the conversation. And you can kind of learn to observe that and see like, is this person actually engaged in this conversation that we're having or have they like checked out? Um, and then you can work on the way you're speaking and you can think about like, okay, well this person checked out after I started talking about like this topic maybe next time, like what can I do differently? Like how can I, maybe it was, you know, too complicated or maybe they, you know, had a political disagreement with the existence of climate change or whatever it was. Like if you take a few moments to reflect after an interaction um, and think about it and see it as a learning moment, then any conversation can become you improving at communications. So I think some of the, the best um, communications trainings or communications practices can be like a taxi ride, um, an airplane or train if you have a conversation with somebody, um, a ski lift if you go skiing, anything where you're just like with random people. Um, and also like things you do outside of work, like if you are a member of a club or like do something besides science, which many scientists don't do enough of, but this is a great opportunity also to practice your communication. So like, how often do you talk to your friends who aren't scientists about the science that you do? Like, those are free, you know, uh, non-scientist reviewers of your communications platform. Like, they are, they are your expert, non experts in not being scientists, and you can use them to review your, your communication strategy on the ground. So, yeah just an encouragement to um, that. And we'll do a bit of that today. And then finally, um, being strategic. And so this is strategic in a lot of senses. I, meant, I mentioned that, you know, of course, you are scientists, um, I think early career scientists, many of you, and so you're very, very stressed, very busy. You have a lot going on. You absolutely cannot do everything. So, so, so don't, like, don't try. Um, but if there's something that you enjoy doing, then do that. Or like if your communication is just like you going to your knitting club and telling your knitting club friends about your research, like that's awesome. That's great. Like that will improve you as a communicator. You can use that in other settings. Um, you know, so it's, yeah, if you like going to speak to school classes, then do that. If you hate going to school classes, don't do that. So just to, you know, like, it's, there can be pressure, like you have to do all of these things and to do the outreach too. So I'm just saying, like, take the pressure off and do what you like and, and have fun with it um, because that will come across as well. Um, also, your skills. Like some people, like I think as scientists, probably everybody has to do public speaking. Um, so maybe you can't avoid that, but you know, you might be able to avoid getting on TikTok, for example, if you don't like TikTok. Or you might be someone who likes being on Twitter and you like the, the written word, or you like, um, maybe you like poetry. You know, all of these are, are kinds of options. Um, and any kind of communication that you do for the general public, I think will also improve your communication you know, in, in writing scientific materials as well, because you'll be thinking more about these, these key messages. Um, and I think I can argue for the IPCC authors, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the messaging workshops that we had helped to hone the writing also of the SPM because they were going back and forth between doing media trainings and messaging workshops and then in the writing of the, the summary for policymakers and then reflecting on like, okay, well, is what we're writing when the journalists read that, is that going to reflect the messages that we're actually trying to get across? And so we had a lot of rounds of this um, and I think that sort of concept can be applied to any, any piece of science. You know, you have your key messages um, and they come from the science, but also you're writing a, a research paper. 
are your key messages coming across in that research paper? So, any questions at this point? Okay, so this is just to sum up. Um, at the beginning, I had this scientist kind of talking at her audience, and now she has reflected on her communication style, and she's um, gotten down on the same level as them, and she's talking about things that they care about. Um, and so in just slightly different words than, than what I said before, you know, the, it's the who, what, and the how, and of course also the why um, of why do they care. So who are you talking to? Who's your audience? What is it that the science says, and what do you want people to take away? And then, how are you going to communicate? What's the best medium? So, yeah. Is this the question how about the microphone? Yeah. <laughs> I made Erica walk very far earlier today with my questions. Uh, for those on online, yeah, this is Alex Ruane. Um, Maybe you'll get to this in a minute, but there's a, a kind of implicit assumption so far that the media or whoever it is wants to hear from us. So can you, maybe you'll get to this in a minute, but how do you, how do you get to the point where you say, I have something I want to say, and then have people actually ask you to hear it? Mm -hmm. It's one thing to be sitting next to somebody on a bus. It's another thing to, to kind of attract media attention. Yep. Um, so I guess that's my, my question. How do we do that, or, or will you get to that maybe later? That's a very good question, um, and um, yeah, I have another slide about that coming up when we talk about the media, so we will get to it. Um, any other questions before we go ahead? Yes. Yes, um, I would like to ask you um, about ChatGBT. Uh, yeah. What do you think how it's shaping this, this science communication? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in my, actually I didn't even introduce myself in my new position, but I'm now working with CGIR, which some of you may know, um, and I'm in the global communications department. And we've just started to explore um, AI and communications as well. Um, and I found it, it can, so basically, you know, it's, it's a language model. Um, I studied neuroscience. So it produces text that sounds plausible. And it's really good, actually, at, um, like if you paste the text of a, a scientific document into it and ask it to produce a summary, it can do like a reasonable job. Um, but it's not always accurate. So I think it can be a really good like um, first draft of like, is my research paper communicating the messages that I want it to? Because it'll pull out like, what seems plausible. It's pretty good at getting like key messages based on kind of where things are in a, in a paper. Um, but then it might just like invent things or make things up that sound plausible. So you can never like fully rely on it. It doesn't have any access to like the current internet. It'll give, it'll take what input you give it and it'll create, you know, a reasonable output. Um, you definitely cannot, at least with chat GPT, um, you can't just ask it to give you key messages about like a specific topic because it'll, it, it's got input data up to like 2021 um, and that's somewhat like there's some very good stuff in there but some of it's quite like some of it's not, it's not up to date and it might be limited. So if you're just asking it to pull out of thin air, it'll pull what it knows which is kind of like just you don't know what you're gonna get. So very useful for kind of summarizing input that you already have um, and, and as like a first step, but you need to then take it and like assess it and practice it and try it out. Um, it also kind of tends to be like, like a bit generic in tone, but you can play with it too. You can be like, okay, well, how would you write that for this audience or how would you write that for that audience? So you can definitely use it to kind of like feedback on things or you can um, you can give it text that like you've written and ask it to like make it shorter or you can ask it to make it into a tweet. It's pretty good at writing tweets um, based on, on inputs. So I think there's I think there's a lot of potential to use, you know, to use AI and, and, um, and chat GPT and other, other tools um, in developing messaging, but you still have to do the the iteration, the practice, and the kind of um, audience interaction. Yeah, very good question. Mm -hmm. Any other?
another. Okay. Okay, so we move on and talk a little bit about the media, and we'll get to Alex's question. So how, I'm gonna give you a little like intro into how the media work. This is like very, very quick overview. <laughs> um, but the traditional kind of like way that, that the research and the journalism world worked um, and through kind of press offices, this, this top model sort of covers that. Um, so back in the day, there used to be researchers in their ivory towers and they would do their research and then they publish their research in a peer-reviewed research paper, and then their press office writes a press release, and maybe they have a press conference about it, and then the journalists come and they interview you, um, and then there's media coverage, and then the general public reads about it in the newspaper, and that's how they find out about science. So this is kind of the you know, basic model up until like early 2000s. Um, in this model, the way that the media find you is that the press office is kind of doing this work. Your press office and the press releases, um, they're making the connections with the journalists. And then usually the journalists, journalists will also like get um, sources. So if this is kind of the research paper to the public model, you know, journalists also get sources that they go back to again and again to ask questions about things. Um, they still do this today, like they tend to go to the same people over and over again to ask questions, and once you have become a, a source for the media, you will continue to be a source. But I'll get more into this in another slide. Um, today, there are way more opportunities and possibilities for communicating um, with the general public. So the media continues to be an important um, channel to the general public, but it's definitely not your only channel. Um, so, and you'll hear more, I think, about, I'm not sure how much you'll be talking about outreach tomorrow, but there are some, you know, different types of outreach events. Social media is a big thing. Um, I don't even have, like, everything on here. There are tons of ways to communicate with the public, um, but also with the media. So, like, the media might find you on Twitter, for example. Um, the media might find you through an outreach event. Um, the media might find you at conferences and various things. So this is just to say that there's much more scope for communications at the moment. It's not like a very simple model. And also, if you have something to communicate, a press release, like there are so many press releases coming out that they're not really the most effective method anymore to reach the media. Um, in, there may be certain cases where they are, like, um, but again, it's kind of case by case basis. So, um, yeah, a little bit more about how the media work and how it's different from science. Like, what's the job of a journalist? Their jobs are to, you know, collect information, gather facts, um, have do research, do interviews, do investigations. Um, when media are interviewing people, they're usually looking for Sometimes they're looking for background and explanation. A lot of times, if they're on deadline, they're just looking for a quote that they can use in their story. They just want you to say like one good thing, and that's all they're listening for. They want like a catchy quote um, that will look good in their in their news in their story, um, and that's really all they want from you. Sometimes, sometimes they're looking really more for explanation and understanding. But yeah, um, they're also choosing what's in the news. Um, and this choosing is, is not always the journalist who's talking to you, but it's an editorial staff, it's the publication, it's um, based on you know, what will drive clicks to their newspaper if they're, if they're not publicly funded. Um, it's based on audience. Um, so you know, what, the new, what the news media coverage covers is based on like a lot of different variables, most, most of which we don't have control over. It's also based on like things have to be newsy. They want it to be new. They want it to be happening now. So um, you know, in the sciences, we have a report being published. That's what we call a news hook in the media. Um, so your communications around like a report being published or a journal article being published, in order for it to be newsy, 
you have to communicate about it when it happens. You can't send a journalist a paper that's a month old because for them that's old news, even if it hasn't been covered. It's probably just at that point to them not interesting, um, except in some cases. But but for mo yeah, in most cases no. Um, but it might be interesting. So like another news hook could be like, well, the whole you know this whole region is on fire. So then maybe your paper about climate change attribution of um, forest fires in this region, maybe then that's of interest to journalists, or maybe you then are of interest to journalists as an expert in that topic. Um, and so, yeah, that's a little bit about that. We can get into it more if there are questions. Um, journalists also tell stories. Their job is to craft narratives. So, um, you know, they don't want to just report facts, but they tell stories that are interesting to people you know, to get people to read their newspapers or their magazines or watch their videos or whatever. Um, so they often are looking not just for facts from scientists, but they're also looking for you as characters or people. Like a journalist might want to write a profile of somebody and they want to know about like who you are as a person and like what you do and what drives you. And this might be extremely uncomfortable um, because it's not like kind of how you have to present yourself as a scientist and also it might feel like self-promotional or awkward. Um, but there is value in this because seeing scientists as people, especially scientists who are not like the white old European men, like this also can give inspiration to a younger generation and to people in other places. So. Um, even though like a lot of this feels uncomfortable, this type of communication, but I just encourage you to don't close it off just because it feels uncomfortable. Um, so yeah, journalists also are supposed to be objective and free of bias. Um, this varies a little bit by country. Um, so like in the US, we pretend that our journalism is like totally, you know, free, unbiased, balanced, um, but this isn't true in the US or really any other country. Um, in some countries, it's more transparent. Like in the UK, there's kind of very clear um, delineations of different newspapers and which are the right and which are the left. Um, and that's kind of well understood and the bias is sort of apparent and acknowledged. In the US, this is true in like some, you know, some of our news coverage. Um, but we also have a bias like, you know, as American journalists, there's, there's a, a bias there. They tend to focus on experts from the US um, and in other countries as well. They want to talk to a scientist from their country. Um, so it's important to, I think, if you're interacting with the media, to understand the media in your country. So to like subscribe to your big newspapers, to watch and listen to the radio now and then, to watch the news, and just understand like what is the media landscape in your country before you jump into it, like so you know what you're getting into if you're going to do an interview. Um, journalism is also deadline driven. So if you're working for like an online media outlet or even some newspapers, you know, back in the day, they still had to operate on like a daily deadline where they had to have their stories written Monday to be published on Tuesday. Now in the online environment, journalists have to write their stories on Monday to be published on Monday. So like I said, when they're calling you and they're looking for a quote, often they want like a 15 minute interview and they really, they've already written the story, they just want you to say something clever, you know, or like have a nice metaphor or have a good explanation of what you're talking about or say something sensational. So you can prepare for that. Like you can have your talking points that are kind of like, your go-to like quotable quote and if you feed that to the journalist they'll use it in their story um, if you're not prepared for that and you're just kind of talking they'll just pull out the most like grabby thing that you say and that may or may not be what you want to read in the newspaper the next day um, yeah and then so that kind of feeds into that last bullet about audience engagement they want the most catchy you know snazzy interesting things so um yeah motivations of journalists um and then alex's question so how do the media find you or how do you get something out to the media um so the traditional model of course is a press release a press conference um but in fact journalists are 
inundated today with press releases and press conferences. So unless you have like a piece of news that a lot of journalists definitely actually want, then having a press conference is probably not going to be particularly useful. A press conference is good if you need to get a lot of journalists in a room and disseminate the same information to all the journalists at the same time. So it's good if you, like an IPCC report has a press conference because everybody's covering the IPCC report on the same day, all the information's being released on the same day, um, and all the journalists are covering it at the same time. If you have a research paper, um, which is quite specialized, and may be of interest to one or two journalists, a press conference is gonna be completely useless and nobody's going to come. Um, a press release, it's kind of like, Many university press offices use press releases um, as kind of a regular thing to get news out. Press releases today, they also get published um, directly to the web and they get picked up um, by like news aggregators and also like there's AI content generators that pick up press releases and write them into, into news content. So they can be kind of useful that way, like they can get a little bit of attention for a research paper or for a researcher. Um, if you have like a press office in your institution, it's definitely good to make use of it. Um, but it's by far like not the only way to get, get media coverage for your research or your paper. Um, journalists also will look for sources through expert databases. So I've highlighted one of these here. Um, the Carbon Brief and I think Reuters Institute collaborated on this. Um, so journalists in many countries are working to expand the, um, the range of experts that they go to. They're trying to correct for having this kind of biased, like white man is the expert model. Um, and so there's been a number of things set up like this one that aim to um, make more visible experts from different places or like women experts and women scientists. Um, so when you see these types of things, like this one in particular is good. Um, you can sign up to be an expert in databases. Um, also universities might have an expert database where you can fill in your expertise. Um, yeah. Um, journalists also use other news stories to find their experts. So this is kind of lazy journalism, but it really happens a lot. So you'll find like once you've been quoted in a story, then other journalists will come to ask you about the same thing. So it's like they're not necessarily reading the research papers, but they're reading the other news coverage about a topic when they write a story on it. So there's not much you can like do to, to make that first, I mean, anyway, like once you have that first big interview, but you might then notice that, that people start to come after that. Um, social media as well. So this was a, a um, message I received on, on my Twitter. Um, a lot of journalists are heavy Twitter users. So having an active Twitter profile where you share, you know, things about your research that can be, um, that can be useful, um, but again, like, like I said before, if you're a Twitter user and you enjoy using Twitter, then go for it, but don't set up a Twitter account just to like, try to get media attention because it won't be worth your time. Um, as you have to kind of take care of it, you have to post regularly, you have to, you know, it needs, needs some attention. Um, but other social media accounts as well, and this varies, I think, depending on country to different social media platforms are bigger in different countries. Um, so it really makes sense to kind of focus in on like one that you enjoy and like um, a platform that, that is relevant where you are. So again, kind of like thinking about your audience. Um, the media find you through your universities and press offices. So journalists sometimes will call you know, if they want to talk about, um, let's say where I'm from, if they want to talk about uh, sea level rise around Seattle, the Seattle Times is going to call the University of Washington and ask them if they have a sea level rise expert who can talk about that. So, um, and then how do the university press offices find their experts? Um, they, you know, it depends on how big they are and how big the organization is. Um, but if you, you, sometimes they have trainings, which are great to participate in. 
Um, and I just recommend that like, if you have a press office in your university or organization, go say hi to them, um, get to know them, participate in anything that they offer. Um, don't be annoying, like don't like send them every single research paper and like tell them to write a press release. Instead, like go and get to know, know them, um, you know, tell them about your research, ask them like how you can improve. They're communications experts and they're there to help you. And, um, you know, by kind of being interested in their work, like they're kind of like your, your in-house journalists in a way. They're looking for good stories from your institution. Um, so definitely a resource there. And then finally, some journalists, so specialist journalists, do look at the literature, um, and particularly the high profile journals. So if you have a nature paper, like you're probably going to get some media interest. And um, nature itself has a press office. All of the big journals have press offices. So you know, when you have that, like, that one big paper, um, your job with that one big paper does not stop when your paper is accepted. When your paper is accepted, then you can start working on the press plans around your paper. And then you can make sure that it gets you know, picked up to the extent that it's going to be picked up. So, and then that's where your, your press office can help you. Questions here? Can we use some kind of clickbait for this? <laughs> so, not a first result, but try to look for, for instance, some examples of very extreme results that will be very attractive to the press. Probably this is not the most representative, but this is true. So then it's a way to attract uh, maybe the media to the work itself and can be used to disseminate the other results. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's like, so there's lots of discussion with like university press offices around, um, you know, press releases, sensationalizing. Um, they have to strike a balance, right? So a press office's job is to get media coverage for their researchers. And so they want to write press releases that are engaging and interesting. And um, I used to work in a press office, and so I would go like, go back and forth with the researchers and it was always the communicators trying to make it like more like striking like really new like really exciting really dramatic and then the researchers would be like no like that's too strong and and the the one line headline would turn into two headlines with lots of like ifs and thens and maybes and like kind of um so there's definitely a balance there and that's something that i think that spending some time to iterate is really good, and this is what we I think did well in the IPCC. Um, is you know you have to have this this balance of like is this accurate, but also is it very much to the point? And so there's no like you could use GPT like as a shortcut to give you lots of ideas, but there's really no shortcut to kind of figuring out like what's going to hit hit the best. Um, you can look at like past headlines, for example. Um, you know, to make sure that like this is, is it, is it the same length? Like, am I using similar words? Um, has this already been said? What can I say that's new? What's different? So all of like, I'm not giving you an exact answer, but like, it's like yes and no. <laughs> Other questions at this point? Hi, um, I am wondering uh, how do you get access to research papers uh, without open access? Because I'm from Argentina and in Argentina um, we, we cannot pay uh, those uh, prices uh, for uh, research papers, uh, so. <laughs> you mean like as a journalist or? Yes, yes. So journalists get free access to most journals. They can sign okay. up um, as, as a working journalist, like Nature, you just contact their press office, and they give you, not only do you get the papers, but you get them ahead of time. You get the embargoed research papers. So for all big, expensive journals, journalists get free access. They also get free access to conferences, um, and sometimes there's even like scholarships 
for journalists for developing, from developing countries or from the global south. Sometimes there's even scholarships to travel. So like the EGU might have a, um, a travel fellowship or like organizations, like there's a World, um, World Federation of Science Journalists. They offer travel funding for journalists to go to scientific conferences. So then they get in for free. They can get, you know, sometimes travel funding um, to cover, cover science. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We, we can ask uh, the authors. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. All right. We're moving along on time, so I'm going to um, tell you, actually, I'm going to skip this because we're going to do interviews later um, today, so we'll come back to that slide. And, oops, so this is kind of the wrap up. I'm giving you my key messages, if you notice. I'm giving them to you again, I'm repeating them. Um, so these, this is what you're supposed to remember from this session for communications with the media, but also in general. Audience, messages, practicing, being strategic. Okay, so messaging. We're getting, I'm gonna stop talking pretty soon and I'm gonna let you like have some space to, to think. Um, but messaging is, it always starts with the audience. So you're not gonna have like just one set of messages that you, or one message that you use. You may have like different sets of messages and you might have some core messages that you then like refine and develop or, or you adapt them to different audiences. And I'm giving you two examples here of a structure because there's no specific way that you have to do this. You can set it up in a way that makes sense to you. Um, so this one on the left is the format that we use at CGIR. We have like one headline message. Um, we have three key messages underneath that and below that we have supporting messages which might be like if it was about an IPCC report, we would have you know, our overarching headline message. We would have three key messages um, and then our supporting messages might be like facts that support those key messages. They might then like refer to um, chapters or, um, or you know, in your case, you might refer to research papers, something like that, or sections of a paper. If this is about one research paper, then the supporting messages might refer to like your figure one, figure two, and figure three. Um, a different version, which you can choose to use, is this is from um, a, a group called Compass Science Communication. And they have a free template available, but also a whole bunch of resources on their website that you can use. Um, they also offer some various trainings. And I'm sure there are like many, many other ways to do messages. Um, but in this one, you kind of sit down with a piece of paper and draw this grid. Um, you start with the issue in the center, which might be like, you know, um, sea level rise in your country, maybe, or whatever you're working on. Um, or whatever it is, you know, your, your research paper finding. You start with the problems, and then you go to, okay, well, who cares, so what? Um, and then solutions, benefits. So um, you've got kind of a, you know, a negative, a problem statement, you talk about solutions, you talk about kind of why it matters, um, and who can benefit. So this is another template you can use. Um, yeah, but again, you don't have to use either of these. The whole point is to try to, you have like so much, all of you, you have so much information in your brains and you know so many details of it, like that neuro, neuron picture I showed you. But like, you have to sit down and really think about like, well, what, who am I talking to and what do I actually want them to remember from this conversation? And so that's where these, these are tools to help you clarify your thinking, to clarify, like your goals in this interaction 
And, um, and the more you do this and the more you refine this, then the quicker it'll become and the more useful it'll become. Then you can take this, you know, these messages, you can then use them in an interview. You'll kind of know like, okay, these are my three key messages I want to get in the cross in this interview. Um, you can use it to write. Like if I gave ChatGPT a message grid, it can do a great job of writing a press release out of that. Like super, like no problem. Um, same with like, you know, a real writer can also use a message grid to write a press release very quickly. Um, so yeah, so that's what we're gonna do for the next, um, we estimated pretty good actually. So let's spend 20, what time is in? 10 to, let's spend the next 20 minutes just on your own, um, quietly. You can work on paper, you can draw the square, you can work on your computer, you can chat with ChatGBT if you like. Um, and what I suggest you do is, um, actually I have this, I have a slide about this. <laughs> so you're gonna develop a message grid or a message box about something of your choice. It can be your research area. It could be a recent research study you did. It could be climate change in general or in a region um, or a topic of your choice that you would like to be better at talking about. Um, then you're going to consider who's your audience, why should they care. I suggest you write all these things down on paper or on your computer, however you're doing it. Um, and you'll want to come up with a headline and your three key messages. Um, and think also about like what background people might need in order to understand your key messages. Alex. Yeah, question on this. Um, so I remember in my IPCC training for working group one, very, very helpful. One of the things that, that they said was, depending on what type of interview it is, it might be an open book test, right? So if it's a radio interview, they can't see your face. You could be looking at your notes or whatever it is. But of course, you can overwhelm yourself if you try to do too many notes. So for this exercise, would you recommend that we think of these grids or these documents that we're making as something that we would be studying to then leave behind and go do an interview? Or would you recommend that we design it as something that you might have on your desk during, let's say, a phone interview with a reporter? Well, how, would you, how would you think we would use this document? Maybe it would help us determine it. So yeah, good question. You are going to use this document in the next exercise. Um, to help you give an interview. So you can have some notes on paper, but you don't know what you're gonna be asked. And we'll talk a little bit about interview skills before you start that, but you're kind of gonna be doing a first practice without, you know, without too much preparation because you're, you're trying it out for maybe the first time. Um, so it's okay if it's like there on paper, but it has to be short enough that you can quickly scan it. You can't like read off your key message when you're in the interview. You have to be able to say it in your own words. Um, so it should be very short. It should really be like, you know, for each key message, one or two sentences and something that you can then also remember. Um, and again, like you might be developing different message grids in the future, but this is just, just one on one topic and then we're going to do an interview on it afterwards. So yeah, I hope that answered your question. Any other questions? I'll leave this up on the board. Okay, so 20 minutes, we will, yeah, and 10 after, we'll come back. And also for you online, same, same homework. <laughs>